I'm Michelle Paver and we're going out live on Facebook and this will also be going out on my YouTube channel uh, and you can also keep up to date with me on Twitter. Um, all the links are on my website, michellepaver.com. Well, this month, uh, what are we going to be doing? We're going to be my, doing my usual update of what's been going on on social media and uh, there's been some great comments actually. And then uh, I'll be recommending uh, a book and a film. I've gone for scary ones this month. And then my favourite bit, which is your wonderful questions and comments. And we've really had a, a bumper crop this month, some fascinating ones that I haven't been asked before, which is always fun. So first of all, moving straight into the social media, um, got a couple that I've actually tweeted. There was the first one was about Shetland ponies. Um, yeah, because I did that's where I learned to ride on when I was five. Um, and it was, they were pretty cunning, actually. Jinx ran away with me. Um, and that was quite scary when I was, when I was five. And I remember, I'm not quite sure how I, at that ended, except that there was an overhanging branch. And I sort of remember seeing it coming straight towards me. And the next thing I knew, I was on the ground. And Jinx was sort of disappearing across Richmond Park. Um, so that was Jinx. Moving on with animals. Um, I think I tweeted something about some scientists who discovered that dogs stare at you when they want you to do something for them. Well, yeah, our Spaniel used to do that as well. I think most dog owners know that. As Ginny tweeted, you cannot resist, you will comply. <laughs> That's exactly what they look like, Ginny. Um, I also tweeted about kestrels because there's a kestrel who lives near near me and flies around. Um, and the kestrel has been busy as it's getting, the, the days are getting longer. Um, oh, and we had a couple of questions about dark matter. Um, just as a general rule, so people know, um, questions are best. If you want to pose questions and you want to get them answered, please go to my website, michellepaper.com, uh, and click on ask. That's the way it'll get answered. But just this once, I'll be answering questions from Twitter. Um, Victoria wants to know if I'm planning any more books. So does Darren. Thank you both, Victoria and Darren, for your wonderful comments. Um, Yes, I am, well, not exactly a ghost story, but I have written a gothic story. I'll be talking a little bit more about that later. And then we've got three questions from Larkspur Primary, which I'm going to, since they were tweeted, I'm going to be quick about them. The first one is huge. How did I plan and write the plot for Wolf Brother? It took a long time. Uh, I can't tell you in detail how I planned and wrote it, but it took months and months and months. Started off with just an idea, and then I just had to sit there and make it up, basically, and do lots of research. Second question was quite interesting, still on Larkspur. Why did you base Wolf Brother around a forest with clans? Well, that's because, Charlie, in those days, 6,000 years ago, the whole of Northern Europe was covered in forest, and I really loved that idea. And there's quite a lot of archaeological evidence that people lived in clans. Um, but then I've, I've made up a little bit more detail about what they, how they lived. What is my favourite book that I've written and why? Well, it's usually the one I've just finished. So at the moment, that's because, um, you know, I've ironed out all the questions and the problems and it's just fresh in my mind. So at the moment, it's this grown up gothic story. So thank you for those. Um, ah, yes, in relation to cats, actually, um, Trassel sent a lovely picture of their rescue cat, gorgeous cat. I wonder, did people in Torex time keep cats? Or was there no need since there was no stored grain, etc.? Well, there's no evidence that they kept cats. Um, they were nomadic hunter-gatherers. As they moved around. That would have caused problems. There were wild cats in the forest, and I've never really included them in the stories because I've never had reason to. But I don't think they kept cats. There wouldn't have been any reason to. Um, and then we've got a whole slew of really fascinating pictures from World Book Day. Um, some amazing things people have been doing. St. Gregory's at Bollington did an amazing dance interpretation of Wolf Brother. Um, really fabulous. Uh, we've got somebody, uh, yes, that's just a small clip. Andy from Worthing, um, actually Andy's son, dressed up as Torek. We've had quite a few Toreks dressing up, actually. Amazing. Lily Louise, who's a primary teacher, um, she's been reading Wolf Brother. To, to year four. I hope they're in, well, absolutely loving it. I hope that's not just you, Lily. Um, fantastic. Thank you for that, Lily. Um, year six at King's Creative Ely. Cave paintings. How, how imaginative. You are really lucky to have such dedicated and imaginative teachers. Um, it's really encouraging as a writer to know that, that people are firing up 
children's imaginations. Um, Rice Lane has made some uh, gorgeous pebble designs. I really like these because I think it's in Outcast that there's some some painted pebbles. And um, that's just the sort of thing that I think the Stone Age people would have communicated by. So that's lovely. Um, what else have we got? Oh, yes, we've got some more really powerful art from Victoria Harrison, who, who is a teacher in Teachers Year 6, I think. Um, and then we've got a, some decorated doors from Joe, who's um, a very talented librarian in Hampshire. Wolf Brothers themed doors for um, World Book Day. And then we've got Blyton Cam Loughton, uh, Church of England Primary School. Actually went to, to a wild woodcraft centre in Lincoln. So there we are, cleaning animal skins, building shelters, the works. And finally, we've just got a couple of gorgeous pictures this is from Fran, who thoroughly enjoyed Dark Matter. Uh, Fran, I am so envious of your very own Isaac. I want him. He's gorgeous, if it's a he. Absolutely beautiful husky. And finally, um, we had some lovely pictures. Waterstones Barnet were kind enough to recommend Thin Air for winter reading. And then that marvellous author, Patrick Gale, I've read a lot of his books, uh, tweeted retweeted it and tweeted pictures from Moomin Land Midwinter, which is one of my favourite books, children's books. So thank you for that. Really fabulous. Um, now, let's just make sure that I, I don't throw out all the, my notes at one point. Um, what we're going to now, yes, it's not quite Mich Ask Michelle Pave or anything. It's, it's my recommendations that we're going to go into now. And that is um, a book and a film. And as I said, I wanted just something a little bit scary. So I'm completely bucking the spring-like trend at the moment. Um, I'm still thinking about scary things. And for a book, I don't think I've ever recommended Dracula. I mean, the original Dracula, 1897, Bram Stoker's Dracula, the one which started it all. Legend has it that he was inspired by a dream. Well, it must have been a pretty special dream because it's a pretty special book. Now, if you're not used to, it's a grown-up book. If you're not used to Victorian novels, be prepared. It's quite lengthy. It's quite, you know, it takes its time, but it's worth reading every line because it builds up quite dramatically. Um, and I think it's the best Dracula ever written, obviously. I'll just read you a tiny bit, actually. This is when Jonathan Harker's in, he's just realised he's a prisoner in Dracula's castle. It's towards the beginning. And he's looking out of the window of his tower. And he looks out of the window and down below, he sees Dracula looking out of the window below. But that's not all that Dracula does. I'll just read you a paragraph. But my very feelings changed to repulsion and terror when I saw the whole man, that's Dracula, slowly emerge from the window and begin to crawl down the castle wall over that dreadful abyss face down, with his cloak spreading out around him like great wings. At first I could not believe my eyes. I thought it was some trick of the moonlight, some weird effect of shadow. But I kept looking, and it could be no delusion. And he goes on. It's really worth reading. Uh, oh, I'll take off my reading glasses. Um, terrific. Now, for a film, I can do no better than recommend one that's, I think, only available on DVD or streaming or something, Dead of Night. Um, it was made in 1945. It's black and white. It's a compilation. It's five ghost stories or horror stories. Some of them are quite famous. You may know them. You may have read them in anthologies. But they are beautifully acted and directed, very atmospheric. Of course, somewhat dated now, but that adds to the charm but genuinely chilling. And I'm not going to spoil the ending, but it's got a sort of structural nightmarish quality about it that is amazingly original and has never been bettered. So um, I do recommend Dead of Night. It's not very long. It packs a punch, a powerful punch. Now we move on to um, Ask Michelle Anything questions. Uh, and this is my favourite bit. And uh, we've got, as I said, quite a bumper crop. I think we're starting off with some comments and questions about ghost stories and writing generally. Um, the first one is from Kate. 
uh, who's been reading Dark Matter. <laughs> I love this. You were reading it. Snowed in in Exmoor. During the final bit, the dog fell off the sofa in shock. <laughs> With love. I sort of imagine the dog reading over your shoulder. I'm sure it's not how you expressed it, but that's what I, the picture I got. And then suddenly seeing the ending and the dog falling off in shock. Um, I'm glad I frightened you, both of you, although I think the dog was frightened by the gust of wind. But you also ask an interesting question. You're curious about the, the photographs um, illustrating the text of Dark Matter in the paperback version. Uh, did I choose them? Why were they included? Well, um, it, they were suggested, it was suggested to me by the editor of the paperback version, Gilliatt, wonderful editor. Why don't we have some photographs? Mm, great idea. Uh, and then she provided lots of examples. And I remember it was quite short timing. I sort of spread them all out on the floor and chose them and then tried to choose the order, you know, because I had to get the, the, the trapper's hut looking right and everything. But I think it does add something. A um, bit of a shame that they didn't do the same for thin air, but they didn't. So there we go. Um, then we have, oh, this is one actually, which has already been asked and answered by last uh, primary. What's my favorite book and why? But again, just to reiterate, best not to ask questions via Twitter because it'll get confusing and, and it'll probably get missed actually. So the best way to answer questions, please, from now on, go to michellepaper.com and click on ask, and then we'll get through, uh, a nice three from Sophia, um, and I'm going to answer them in reverse order. Where where was I born? Uh, I was born in Malawi, but at that time, which is Central Africa, at that time it was called uh, Nyasaland. What's my new book called? Haven't got a title yet. Uh, it's a gothic story, a grown-up gothic story, but we haven't quite fixed on a title yet, so I can't announce it. What was my first book written when I was about five? Well, it wasn't actually a book, but I've got the very thing. Here we are. You can probably see it was typed quite badly by me when I was five. It's called Ebony, the Mouse Goddess. Um, and the Mouse Goddess, well, their most hated enemy were the people of Eshkalolo, the rat. Ebony lived in a beautiful spider plant, but somehow that was under a glacier. And while the god was away, Ebony, the Mouse Goddess, had to get them away, save her people from the glacier. And so it goes on. And the spelling is really quite imaginative. But there we are. So thank you for that, Sophia. Uh, our three from Valerie, whom I met in Costa Rica. Thank you, Valerie. Um, first one, yes, why did you sing Danny Boy to ward off the bear? Well, the reason for that, uh, Valerie, was that when you're walking in the woods, which I had been for weeks before I met the bear, uh, you're supposed to make a noise, call out or sing or something to warn them that you're coming so you won't have a nasty encounter. So I had been singing Danny Boy because uh, it kind of fits my voice. So that was the first thing that I slipped into when <laughs> uh, I saw the bear. Um, and another one from Valerie. Oh, you finished by then you finished Thin Air and you really enjoyed it and liked the cover. I'm so glad you enjoyed that. There's another one that Valerie posted that was a little bit too long to post, but I'm really glad you enjoyed the books, Val. Um, moving on to Madeline now. Um, again, some something... I'm glad you like my books. What goes into publishing a book and how does a manuscript get turned into a published work? What shouldn't you do? Well, I'll, I'll start off with what shouldn't you do first. Don't send to a publisher an entire book, a whole manuscript, because that'll just clog up their offices and they won't like it. The best thing to do um, is these are just the covers, but you can get these from the library. There's the writer's handbook and the writers and artists yearbook that they're both about the same um, and they basically have um, have a look at those because they list all the publishers and agents and the types of books they, they like to publish and also what they want to see from you and quite often it's just one chapter and a synopsis a summary or just one chapter and a letter so then they can have a look at your writing and see if it's any good or not because remember they get a lot of things sent through them sent to them and so it's really important to, to do that rather than just sending them a whole book, which will just annoy them. Um, once you've, you know, that's going to take you a while to get a publisher. I won't, I won't lie to you. It could take ages. Say you get lucky and after maybe a few years or something, you get a publisher. How do you get your book? Pub how does it, what happens then? Well, you, you've written the book. Then what happens is the editor will read it and give you some comments on it. They might say, yeah, this bit gets a bit boring or 
I'm a bit confused here. Why does Torrent do that? Um, so they'll make suggestions to you. It's always up to you whether you work on those suggestions or not. Uh, if you've got a good editor, as I had a wonderful editor, Fiona Kennedy, Kennedy for my Chronicles books and John Wood for my ghost stories, then yes, I will sort of um, take up most of their comments, not all of them. And then you've got the bit I don't like, which is correcting all the spelling errors and things like that. And then you have to choose the covers and the design department will come up with ideas, but then the editor, the the, pub, the writer also has some comments. I thought it might be quite fun to show you the original ideas for Walt Brother, because I don't think I've ever shown you those before. Here's, here's the very first one, which is beautiful, but I think it looks a little bit young. It possibly looks as if it's for a sort of much smaller, younger age group than it is. Then there was something a bit more sort of like modern or cave art or something. Um, you see all sorts of different ideas. And then there was this, which was quite fun. And we ended up using some of those symbols, but perhaps wasn't quite exciting enough. And then there, there's something, wait a minute, I'm about to lose all these, um, which has a lovely sort of red ochre cover. But I thought, well, that's just a little bit too sort of basic, you know. Um, but it was a sort of stepping tone, stone to what was the first cover of Wolf Brother, which I think is gorgeous. Um, so that just, I mean, some of you may not have ever seen that first cover because you, you know, you were born uh, after it was produced, but that was the first cover. So that there's a lot of work that goes into publishing a book. So um, thank you for that. Interesting one. I could go on for a, a long time about that. Um, Naomi now. Uh, we've got a lot of questions, so I better I better speed up, haven't I? Naomi, who speaks the most amazing English, given that she's 12 and she's from Sweden. Um, yeah, what was it that inspired you when you wrote the Wolf Brother books? Um, well, I think when I was little, uh, I read stories about wolves and boys, and I wanted a wolf of my own. And because I was inspired by that. And there was also a big book of pictures from the Stone Age that my parents had. I'll reach over and get it. Um, very dramatic pictures, very dramatic pictures. Here's one of people um, sort of having some kind of rite in a cave um, with a bare skin. And you can see where I got some of the ideas that fed into Wolf Brother, I think. And then, of course, when I was grown up, I met a bear in the forests of California, and that was very frightening. I won't, don't have time to tell you the whole story, but if you go to my website, uh, you should be able to follow the links and find it there. I tell you the story of meeting the bear. So that's where all those things came together, and I got the idea for Wolf Brother. Um, you also asked, what were my favourite books? Did I have a favourite writer when I was younger? Well, when I was very small, it was... Um, Tova Janssen. Let me just reach down and get them. I've got all sorts of props. Um, the Moomin books. Here's my very battered copy of Finn Family Moomin Troll. don't know if you can see that. And I love the forest in there and, and um, all the, the animals and the Moomins, of course. And then here is Myths of the Norsemen. So there we are, Naomi, from Sweden, Norway, the, the myths of the Norsemen. Um, I love that as well. So, yeah, I, animals, the myths, um, the North, I loved all those things. And that's what probably came together and produced Wolf Brother. Moving on, Jeff. Uh, oh, this is a really interesting question. Do you have a certain, need a certain writing, writing environment to write a ghost story? You know, Jeff, I had to, yes, could you write one sitting on a beach? Jeff, I had to go back to my notes to see when I actually wrote Dark Matter and Thin Air. And it's quite interesting because I planned Dark Matter in the winter. I wrote the first draft, which took quite a long, several months. I wrote that during the summer. Uh, but then the rewrites, which are the, the really, with me, the important time when I really sort of make the thing come alive, that was over the winter. And then when it came to Thin Air, the whole thing was written over two consecutive winters. So I think I think that's clear that um, it's better, it's easier for me, and certainly the rewrites, which is when the whole thing really comes together. I think I need it. I need the winter, particularly the darkness. 
that's what I need because it's, you know, I live in England, south, southern England. It's not that cold. But um, it was a really interesting one because I wouldn't have been able to answer that if I hadn't gone back to my notes. So thank you for that. Joanne here. Uh, when is your next adult horror coming out? Um, I'm so glad you liked both of them. Eagerly awaiting your next title. Thank you. Well, um, I've touched on this before. I've written, just finished, uh, an adult gothic story, which does have a ghostly element more than I'd thought it did, but I sort of wrote it more as a sort of gothic story. And I haven't got a title for it yet, um, a working title, not quite sure. Uh, I'm not quite sure when it's going to come out either, perhaps late at the end of this year or perhaps next year. Um, because, of course, we're going to need to do all the stuff I've just mentioned, the editing and the looking for the right cover and choosing a title, that sort of thing. But thank you for that. A couple of comments on uh, Gods and Warriors now. Oh, we've got something from Alejandro Colucci, who did the covers for Gods and Warriors, and I didn't know this. His son, Bruno, was the model for Hylas, who's the hero of Gods and Warriors, on the covers. So thank you very much, Alejandra, for all your work. And um, I particularly love The Burning Shadow. That that one I, I just thought was particularly gorgeous. So thank you for all that. And thank you, Bruno, for being the model for Hylas. Um, fascinating. And finally, Matt uh, has difficulty. He can't, can't get the third book of Gods and Warriors. There are five books in all from Amazon. That's disturbing, Matt. Um, I... I'm afraid I can't help you with that. But could I just say to anybody, you included, Matt, if you have a problem getting hold of any of my books, we have now put um, an unavailability report form on my website. So what you do is you go to www.michellepaver.slash report. And if you can then just, it's very, very quick. If you just fill in the few details, then that will go to my agent who will take it up with the publishers. Of course, you can also take it up with the publishers directly. And, and uh, if you feel like it, do, please. Um, but thank you for letting me know about that, Matt. I'm sorry. Um, here we go. Aaron. Yes, this is an interesting one. I just finished the Bronze Warriors um, series, and I was wondering if you could write a small book about Pyrrha's and Issy's adventures before and after and, and during the book's time. Yeah. Do you know what? That's really interesting, Aaron, because I had planned Issy's book as a little, you know, issy story. I had it all planned, but then the publisher sort of lost interest in it, so I never wrote it. Um, so thank you for that. Who knows? Maybe at some point in the future that might come about. But thank you for your interest in that one. Now, moving on to all things Chronicles of Ancient Darkness, uh, we've got a couple of lovely comments. One from, uh, actually this is from Matthew about his son, Zachary. Zachary has two seriously wonderful parents. Matthew and Alison, who spent two weeks, she spent two weeks making this amazing costume um, for Zachary for World Book Day. And then the school was promptly snowed out, so he couldn't go. But it's it's amazing. It's roebuck skin, sinew and twist. She, uh, Alison twisted lime bark together to make the cord. She made file slate knife. It really looks really authentic. And I love the size of the bow as well, because often people make bows too small. Well, I hope you had fun, Zachary, even if school was um, snowed out, or perhaps especially because it was snowed out. And now we have a, a really lovely, thoughtful comment from Flippy. Um, no, you've skipped. Where's Flippy? We've lost Flippy. Well, anyway, perhaps Peter can find Flippy. That's number six on our um, sheet. Can we find him? Okay. Yes. Well, for some reason we've lost Flippy, but I just want to read this one because it's lovely. She's she's 15 years old. I just wanted to say how much I absolutely love your Wolf Brother series. I can read them again and again and never tire of them. She talks about wolves are her favourite animal and I hope one day to go to Norway and see them. And this is the bit I wanted to read out anyway, so it doesn't matter if it's not on screen. Um, I'm really interested in the era the books are set in. I love the idea of clans, especially named after different animals. I wish I could experience life like that, at least what it would have been like. The spiritual side of it is also so beautiful and mysterious, if slightly haunting. It would mean so much if you could reply, but I feel bad saying that, so don't worry at all if you can't. What a lovely, thoughtful thing to say, Flippy. Um, and I really appreciate your comments, and I think you put it very well about why you're attracted to that time. I think that's probably why I'm, I was attracted to the time and why I wanted to write about it. 
So you've expressed that beautifully. Thank you for that lovely, thoughtful comment. And now we move on to Pierre and Leonie. Um, Leonie is Pierre's mama, and Pierre is 12 and has been listening to the books on audio, uh, on Audible. Um, and yes, this is one of two comments. Um, Leonie is just asking, do I do any book signings? Because it'd be lovely to get a signed copy. Well, I tend not to do book signings unless there's another book coming out. Uh, and then I'll do a little clutch of them. So at the moment, I haven't got any plans to do any. Um, and that's a similar answer to Kelly's question, which is the next one. Um, just curious if you ever do book signings, because we love your books and it, we'd love to get an autograph. At the moment, I'm not. Um, I tend to just love to sort of bury myself and do some writing. But um, if I as and when I next do any signings, it will be on my website. So that's the place to find out. And I'll also put it on Facebook, um, mention it and tweet it and that sort of thing. So you will be able to find out about it. Now, moving on to Carly, um, fifth grade student in New York, Love Wolf Brother. I'm so glad to hear that, Carly. Uh, my question is, how did you think of the story? Because I have a hard time thinking of stories. Another question is, how long did it take? to write the books. Well, I have a hard time thinking of stories too, Carly. Um, everybody does. You know, how did how did Wolf Brother start? You know, it started with a memory of me wanting a wolf as a 10 year old and thinking, oh, it'd be really nice to write about a wolf. And then I and I looked at, I had tried to write a story at, at university about that. And a few paragraphs were written from the wolf's point of view. And I thought, oh, I really, ooh, I like that. But then, you know, where do you set it? How do you how do you make the story? That's a lot of hard work. And knowing a little bit about how to write stories, you know, starting with your main character and, and their motivation. But it's hard work. So that's all I can say at the moment about that. How much time did it take? Well, it took about, again, I had to look at my notes for this. For Wolf Brother, it took about four months of sort of planning the story, including the other five books and researching, you know, getting into the Stone Age, um, and then about six months to write the story itself. Uh, that was because I was under quite a lot of pressure as well, time pressure. And it's not a very long book. I mean, the book I've just finished, which is the Gothic story, which is much longer, I took about 18 months of solid work to write and research. So, yeah, it takes a long time. It's not easy, but good luck. If, if you're going to be trying it yourself. Similarly, from Kyle, we have someone, he's a, a high school student, American high school student, you're doing quite a long um, uh, sort of project about the relationship between Torax, um, the strength he acquires through his relationships and how that feeds into his battle against the Soul Eaters and what he learns from it. And if you could just go on to the final bit at the end, if you could offer some commentary on how the relationships between Torek and Wolf and Wren help him overcome the Soul Eaters, that would be great. Yeah, well, that's kind of like what the story's about. <laughs> Kyle, so nice one asking me to do your homework for you. But no, I mean, fair enough. You're asking the question. Um, I think you've you've correctly identified, which is the great thing, um, that it is the relationships between Torak and Wolf and Wren that show Torak's character. That's how we learn about character in, in books. That's how we get involved, is watching what they do under stress. Um, and you're quite right to focus in on the relationships. Um, I think just to give one example, you know, I was trying to think of a few examples. Um, in book three, in, in Soul Eater, when Torak is seeking Wolf, he's trying to rescue Wolf from the Soul Eaters, there's a great issue of trust there because Wolf's tail is hurt, if you remember, and Wolf has to trust Torak. Uh, and um, it, what happens there also builds the trust further and then affects how they work together against the Soul Eaters in that book. Um, so there are lots of examples you can find in the different books. Sometimes the trust is broken, as in book four, um, when Wolf and Torak split up for reasons you can probably remember, and also Tarek and Wren, they have a, a major schism. I try not to say too much in case people haven't read the books. But um, so I don't think I can say too much here, except that you have identified the sort of crux of the story and good luck. Um, I'm sure your project will be pretty good. 
based on on what you've said in your in your um, post. Moving on to John Shepherd, this is a slightly easier one. Where did you get the, the wolf stuffed animal in this picture? Here he is. Here is the very same. Do you know he doesn't have a name? He's just wolf. A wolf. He's not the wolf in the books. Um, I'll tell you where I got him. I was on a book tour, one of the first for Wolf Brother. I was in Chicago in a bookshop and the daughter of the bookshop owner had him and was playing with him and I admired him a bit too much. And so the, uh, um, the lady said, oh, do you want to, do you want to give him to Michelle? And actually the little girl was really nice. I suppose she could get another one because they sold them in the shop. He is actually a glove, glove puppet, but I never submit him to the indignity of putting my hand up his tummy. Um, but he kept me company on all my, um, all my book tours and everything. And he was, fantastic and, and I used to take him to events and things so he now lives in honorable retirement in my study um I don't I, I don't I cut off the label so I'm afraid I don't know um what his name is so there we are ah we've got another one yes Mohammed Amin has asked a very technical question a good one I'm really glad you like the books um what type of shelters do the clans particularly the raven clan live in do you have any pictures and were they used, really used in post Ice Age times? As to whether they were really used, I don't know. We don't have that much evidence for how how the clans lived in Tarax time, but they did use the sort of materials that I've I've mentioned in the books. Um, I tried to find a picture of the kind of thing I was thinking of, and I haven't got one. But I've got a tiny diagram from a sort of survival manual. I don't know if you can see that. Probably not. Can you? Um, yeah, there we are. That sort of shows, it's a sort of lean-to. This is not covered in reindeer hide yet, but it's sort of got one side open. And then if you can see there's a fire and then there's a sort of pile of logs behind the fire, which is like a reflector. That's the rough idea, very rough for a Raven's, uh, uh, Raven Clan's open fronted shelter. There are traditional shelters built like that in Siberia, they also do them in Finland. And the, where I got the idea was that I actually slept in them when I was doing my research for Wolf Brother in Finland. Um, and it, they're amazing because they've, they've got in Finland, they had a sort of what they call a smoke trap, which is a beam across at the top of the front of the open bit. And so the smoke from the fire comes up, hits the beam and gets shoved up. And so it doesn't go inside the shelter and get all smoky. But it's lovely because you're lying. It was of snow on the ground. It was really cold, but you could see the sort of the the firelight reflected on the inside of the shelter because you were open. But it was it was still really nice and warm. And I was in lots of reindeer hides, and it was so warm and, and cozy. And yet it was open to the sounds of the forest. So as I say, there's a Finnish sort of uh, kind of shelter like that, and Siberian shelters. So they do work. Um, and that's what I had in mind. Although actually in, I think in Ghost Hunter, in the middle of winter, when it's really cold, the ravens use a different kind of shelter. The whole clan gets together. I think I mentioned that. Um, and that's sort of tree trunk walls plugged with moss, again, with reindeer hide over it. So I haven't got any pictures really, but that's the best I could do. I hope that helps. Um, Anne here, yes, similar thing. And this is really interesting. I've had this a few times. Would you ever do a Chronicles guidebook? You know, really nice to know more about, you know, as, as Mohammed asked about the shelters and tools and weapons. And she says, um, and says, you know, I understand if you don't want to do that until you know if you're going to write another Chronicles book. Uh, it's also a question of time, and because I keep writing other books. But yes, I would love to do one. And funnily enough, I was looking through my files um, just the other day. And there's so much that I haven't been able to mention in the books that it would be lovely I'm sure at some point um, when I get a little gap of time and the timing is right, I will do one. I will do a Chronicles guide guidebook. I quite like that name. Um, so thank you for that. Now, Simon, yes. Simon said, I'm not a great reader, but um, Chronicles of Ancient Darkness, read it on holiday, was hooked off the first chapter. My question is, will we ever see the Chronicles of Ancient Darkness adapted for stage and film? And you say, thank you for such a lovely, a fantastic trilogy. Trilogy is actually three books. Just so you know, Simon, it's six. So if you haven't read the last six, three books, um, you're in for a treat. <laughs> in terms of uh, film or stage, 
what can I say? I have done film deals in the past. Most film deals don't end up being actually made into a film. Mine haven't so far. I haven't got a film deal at the moment for Wolf Brother, but who knows? You'll hear it first on my website or on, on Michelle Paver Live. So at some point it'll happen, but not yet. Don't hold your breath. Um, we're getting towards the end here now. Lily. Ah, yes. Lily asked an interesting one. Uh, random question. I'd really like to know for a project I'm working on. What are all the names of each full moon in the Chronicles of Ancient Darkness? Well, I can't give you all of them uh, because they're not all mentioned in the six books. But the one thing I can tell you, and you find that out if you're eagle eyed in Ghost Hunter, is that there are 13 moons in Torax year because actually the lunar cycle is 28 days. And we know that because the clan tattoo of the Swan Clan are 13 little dots on the forehead um, to mark each of the moons. And I did look up in my. Um, you see, what I could say to you, Lily, is you know what? You're going to have to read all six books and then pick out which moons. I mentioned where, but it gets a bit complicated for you. That would take you ages. Uh, so I can give you some of them. I can give you the ones in spring. Um, March, our equivalent for March roughly, is the moon of roaring rivers. April is the birch blood moon. May is the moon of the salmon run, about. Um, summer, June, moon of no dark. July, the cloudberry moon. August, the moon of green ash seed. Autumn, roughly September, moon of roaring stags. October, the blackthorn moon. Winter, November, the moon of red willow. Now, once we get into proper winter, December, January, February, and so on, that's when we start getting a little bit more complicated. And I haven't mentioned them all, so I'm not going to mention winter after that last one I mentioned, which was November, the moon of Red Willow. Um, but that's giving you some to go on. And of course, then some of the other clans, like the sea clans, have different names and the not the ice clan. So it all gets quite complicated, which is why I've never really posted a, a calendar um, on my website. Let's say that that will be reserved for the uh, guide to Torax World when I finally publish one. But thank you for that. Um, and we're getting to the end now. Erin, um, whose little brother Liam has just finished Chronicles and can't stop talking about them. I'm so glad about that. He has a small question. Well, it's it's a short question, but it's not a small one. Um, and we've slightly edited this for spoilers, just so you know. What happens to Torek and Ren at the end of Ghost Hunter? Do they start a new clan? Well, they don't start a new clan because, you know, clans are old and have been around for a long time by the time Tarek and Ren come around. Um, I'm not really going to tell you what happens to them. I've sort of left that up to people to imagine for now. Um, and I've also left the door open so that maybe I can come back and write another book at some point if I get a really good story. I've never ruled that out and they've always stayed with me. So I'm, I'm very tempted about that. And that, that brings me to my last um, quite spectacular one from Alyssa, who's in the eighth grade, uh, started reading in four years ago. I think this is a record, Alyssa. You've read Outcast 64 times. That is something. I don't think it's excessive at all. Um, I reread and reread my favourite books. They become like your best friends. So I'm delighted that one of mine has been reread so many times. Um, and I love the fact that you can bond personally with the characters. That's my aim that's what i get out of my favorite books so you've obviously got a very vivid imagination and i love the fact that your favorite character is dark because he's one of my favorite characters i'm really glad about that um my question is are you planning on writing any more series and this is the last question i'm going to be answering on this edition i would love it if you did well i'm glad you would like it am i going to be planning on writing any more series yes i started a new series two weeks ago um, I've been researching it before and I've now begun to write it. What is it about? Well, I'm not going to say, I'm afraid. So is it Bronze Age? Is it Stone Age? Is it something entirely different? Um, I'm afraid I can't tell you. 
I never like to write to talk too much about books I'm actually writing, but I have started actually writing. And my goodness, I'd forgotten how hard it is to write chapter one of anything. <laughs> it really is very hard indeed. But thank you for that. Um, and thank you for all your questions. Um, it really is very encouraging. And I, and I love getting your questions and comments. So do please keep them coming. And um, as I say, um, if you go to, you can go on Twitter or you can, the best way to, to post a question is to go to michellepaver.com, um, click on ask. That's by far the best way. You could follow me on Twitter. Um, and I think that's all I've got to say for the moment, um, except happy reading. Uh, do enjoy whatever you're reading and stay well. And I'll see you next month. Bye.